husband one at noon the same bell rang. And I was under, understanding that um, as that evolved, the energy for this community gathered here and people simply were together. Apparently I'm not on. I bet you can now. So at 9-11, 2001, at noon, the bell began to ring, to ring rather. And um, I think it really, there was a loss to say, how do we respond? How do we somehow gather? And I think that became the answer. Let's just simply gather. And I'm so pleased to welcome you this afternoon as we gather once again. And we've had 13 years, and we've had more activities, and even today, and yesterday there's more news about violence and about oppression and about war. So our jobs never seem to cease. But my hope is that one of the great things that we're learning is that gathering is important and sharing stories. This is, I think, the 10, how many year, years have we been doing this? I think it's 10 of this service. And that marks a time for us as a community in Harrisburg. I've been the dean here, I'm working on my 10th year, and this certainly happened the very first several months that I was here. And one of my favorite services was when we had five different speakers and we were describing things. And I remember I talked about my roots from Native America, um, where my grandfather was Rob, John, um, John Roth from Mary Pocahontas. You can give him if you want. But it's true. So I was part of this interfaith marriage, I mean, from the very inception of this country. And then Carl, I think, spoke, um, Rabbi uh, Carl Chopper spoke about your grandparents in Auschwitz and um, just the violence. I don't know which, but it was the same thing. And then somebody from India spoke. And my favorite comment was that he had five siblings. They all had five different languages. They were all living on five different continents. And I'm saying, and you still call yourself family. But that's exactly the point. We are family. Whether we have different languages, whether we're on different cultures, whether we're on different continents. So it's with great pleasure we welcome you as we once again gather and we ponder some of the issues that I think continue to haunt us. But I also hope that we find a hope a sort of revival of spirit, and particularly a new connection that we truly are more together than we often give ourselves credit for. So may that light that God's grace offers to all people shine brightly in this place this afternoon. And I want to welcome David as he introduces our program. Thank you, Churchill. Um, one of the early questions we got when we began considering this topic was, what's the relationship between 9-11 and the founding vision? And we thought about this for a while. I had been thinking about it for a while. And I remembered that after the occurrence of 9-11, there was an explosion of a very ugly anti-Muslim feeling in this country. And I thought to myself, how does this fit? Because I knew that Thomas Jefferson uh, who had a copy of the Quran in his library. He was deeply interested in Islam. And he dined with Muslims in the White House. And so I, when I began getting all these emails with, well, Jews and Muslims weren't here when the country was formed. We don't have to pay any attention to them. I knew that was wrong. <coughs> so, our program today is an exploration of, of what the founder's vision was in terms of multi-faith beginnings. And we are privileged to have two outstanding experts on these questions. And I want to thank all of you for coming.
It is not as if the problems and complications and even the dangers of the world had not been there before. There were many events that led up to September 11, 2001, as there have also been many events that have followed. But on September 11, the events and complications of the world seem to come much closer. At least many of them, many of them became part of our awareness and have never fully left. We live in an ever more interconnected world, and we live in a diverse world, which we are increasingly more aware of, and in a diverse country, which is increasingly more diverse. And that, that diversity is not the problem, but it comes with many challenges, as well as opportunities. For us to learn and model for others how to live in a diverse world, we must first learn how to live in a diverse country. This day is also the bicentennial of the Battle of Baltimore and the composition of the Star Spangled Banner. It is an appropriate day to consider what this country stands for. And we will be exploring what the founders of our country may have thought about the relationship between official religion and public society. It is significant and it is interconnected. The founders of this country were aware that Christian civilization had torn itself up with war over this question for centuries before them. They were aware that these new United States were filled with the very religious diversity that had torn Europe apart. This country could not succeed if the question of which religion was in charge was going to be up for grabs. For our purpose today, we must remember that the events of September 11, 2001 were committed in the name of God. However uncomfortable that makes us feel, and I hope it does, we cannot forget it. We may vehemently believe that it was an inappropriate use of the name of God. Indeed, I hope we believe that it was an inappropriate use of the name of God. We may not understand how it could be in the name of God, and it is understandable that we might not understand, but we must understand. The scholar Mark Lilla of Columbia University writes that we do not understand because it is that we are separated from our own long theological tradition of political thought by a revolution in Western thinking that began roughly four centuries ago. I'm going to read one paragraph from his book. We live, so to speak, on the other shore. When we observe civilizations on the opposite bank, we are puzzled since we have only a distant memory of what it was like to think as they do. Again, he says, it is we who are separated from our own long tradition of political thought by a revolution in thinking. We see that others face the same challenges of political existence we face and ask themselves many of the same questions we do regarding justice, legitimate authority, war and peace, rights and obligation. Yet their way of answering those questions has become alien to us. The river separating us is narrow yet deep. On one shore, the basic political structures of society are imagined and criticized by referring to divine authority. On the other, they are not. And this turns out to be a fundamental difference. Historically speaking, though, it is we who are different, not they. In other words, if I may be so bold to say, it is because we as a nation do not claim to exist by divine right, because we are a nation authorized by the people, not by God, that we do not understand the claims that the event of September 11th can ever be committed in the name of God. 
And yet, there are many among us in America who claim that the United States is, and always was, intended to be a Christian country. If this is understood as a Christian country, a country whose existence is authorized by the word of God, that opens up the question again. We, if this country is authorized by God, we, if we have that understanding, we take a first step back towards the understanding of how such violence of September 11th can be God's will in the name of God. Let us begin our discussion. Professor Pia, um, Professor of History at uh, Messiah College. Well, thank you for that, those words, Rabbi. And a, a lot of what I'll have to say today will, uh, I think, resonate with some of these things that you mentioned. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out. I am a historian, and we don't usually get people coming out at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoons for historical lectures. So it's, so it's good to be here, and it's good to reflect on uh, the events that happened 13 years ago and try to provide my job, my business, is to try to provide historical perspective uh, for those events. Uh, on uh, that day in 2001, I was teaching at a Lutheran uh, college, Valparaiso University in northwestern Indiana. Uh, I was sitting in my office at the time, uh, you know, shocked, watching the television just like everybody else was. Uh, and then uh, as the day went on and as the week following September 11th went on, uh, I began to get asked a question, the same question over and over again. As an American historian, I was asked, what is the historical significance of what happened uh, on September 11th or earlier today or earlier this week? Um, my initial response as a historian was, I have no idea. Ask me in another 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years and I may be able to tell you what the historical significance of this event was. Now, certainly, I could make some trivial connections uh, to, uh, say, the attack on Pearl Harbor or uh, the British invasion of Washington, D.C., in 18, uh, the War of 1812. Um, but as a historian, my job is to kind of analyze, contemplate, uh, specific events af long after they have passed. And it would be very, very, very difficult to reflect historically on an event at the moment that that event happened. Uh, nevertheless, we are 13 years removed. Uh, and we've seen the implications of, uh, especially the religious implications of what stemmed from 9-11. Uh, we've seen uh, those in a certain political and, and religious camp hunker down and claim, as the rabbi mentioned, that we're a Christian nation. We've heard others talk more in terms of religious freedom, uh, in terms of the fact that we are not defined by religion at all, but we are rather a secular uh, nation. Uh, whatever the case on that front, and I will try to make some historical uh, gestures towards helping us understand those questions a little better, I think a celebration like this, or a commemoration, I should say, like this, uh, forces us all to look at the past, forces us all as a nation to look at the past and see what the vision of our founders was for the United States and how that vision relates to these questions of religion and public life religious freedom, secularism, Christian nationalism, uh, and all of these other ways of trying to define the religious identity of this country. Uh, so if you weren't expecting a history lesson, you are going to get one uh, today. Um, but again, as I speak about what I think is the very, very multicultural roots, religious roots uh, of the American colonial and revolutionary experiment, 
Uh, hopefully, it will provide some context for understanding the religious world in which we live in today, uh, some 13 years after those tragic events of September 11. Now, as an American historian, I am very, very aware of the fact that American history was introduced in schools or became important for Americans to learn uh, out of a sense of patriotism, out of a sense of we need to know our past in order to understand who we are in the present. If you are thinking about American history in those terms, then the penultimate, the most significant event in the American past, the event that created the United States, obviously happened on July, uh, in July of 1776, July 4th, uh, when the United States came into existence as a nation, uh, the American Revolution. And indeed, as Americans, I believe we should know something about the American Revolution, what the framers and founders and shapers of that revolution believed about the kind of country that they were trying to create. At the same time, though, sometimes when we focus all of our attention on that penultimate event, we sometimes lose track of other actors, other historical players, other human beings who are part of the American story, but we, also, we often do not pay them much attention or give them any credibility simply because they do not fit into our overwhelmingly, as historians like to call it Whig, uh, I'll call it nationalistic narrative. So people like, obviously, George Washington and John Adams and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson are important. Women, for example, may be important as long as they somehow contribute to the national narrative. So people like Molly Pitcher and Abigail Adams and so forth become the heroes of the American Revolution. Um, but very, very little, very few other people actually contribute. Their voices do not necessarily count because the reason why we are supposed to study the so-called 13 colonies is to get to the revolution and thus establish the great nation that we are today. Now with that in mind, what I want to challenge you to do today is I want to challenge you to think about the 17th, the 18th century, the, settle, the colonial settlements of North America, uh, the revolution, in a slightly different way. By thinking rather in terms of politics, rather in terms of you know, who are those people that are going to eventually found the nation, what if we were to treat the people living here in North America as human beings and think about them as if the revolution never actually happened. Now, I'll get back to the revolution here in a second, but you'll see what I mean here. If we do that, if we look at human beings who may or may not have been involved in this great political event of 1776, then maybe some different actors enter into our story. And the dignity of those actors become important to us. So. When we think about, for example, the American colonies, right, the colonies that existed before 1776, yes, we can think about those 13 colonies that eventually rebelled uh, from England and declared independence and became the United States. But existing in the 17th and 18th century worlds of North America, you had French colonies. They had nothing to do with the American Revolution. You had British colonies in the Caribbean that were part of the British Empire. You had thousands upon thousands of Spanish in places like Florida, in places like the southwest of the United States today. You had Swedes on the Delaware River. You had Russians in the Pacific Northwest. All of these groups, now these are just the European groups, had a presence here in the United States, but not all of them fit the story we want to tell about 13 colonies breaking away and forming a new nation. But they were here. And in my Judeo-Christian tradition, they had dignity and they had worth and they had value and their stories are worth telling. But let's expand the horizon a little bit. 
What about those 600,000 slaves? Those 600,000 human beings that were exported into North America during the colonial period, who really play no role whatsoever in the founding of our nation, but they're there and their stories are worth telling. What if we were to think about the 50 to 100 million Native Americans that were present on this continent before the arrival of Columbus in 1492? There were only 2 million people in the colonies, the 13 colonies at the time of the revolution. There were close to 50 million Native Americans who we don't know much about because they did not feed, or at least our children don't know much about, because they do not feed into this story of America. What I'm trying to suggest is the American colonies were very, very diverse places. North America were very, very, was a very, very diverse place prior to the American Revolution. And of course, if America, if, if all of these different groups are here, rubbing shoulders with one another, interacting with one another, trying to construct some type of society, maybe not a nation yet, but some type of society defined by pluralism and civility, they're worth considering. Now we can go back to that question of civility here in a second because for some groups it was not very civil. This must mean they also, they were also, it was also multicultural in terms of religion. Of course, we know, many of us know about the dozens and dozens of different Protestant sects uh, and churches that came to North America and settled in those regions known as the 13 colonies. You have the Puritans, the Cal English Calvinists in New England. You have the Church of England, the Anglican Church occupying Virginia and, and really present in all 13 of the colonies. You have the Pennsylvania Quakers, the Scots-Irish Presbyterians, the Swedish Lutherans in the Delaware Valley, the French Huguenots uh, fleeing to New York after the Edict of Nantes drove them out of France. All the German groups, the Lutherans, the Moravians, the Mennonites, various other forms of Anabaptists, the Reformed, and then the Baptists themselves. Protestantism in and of itself is an incredibly diverse religion in the colonies. Then you have other Christians, Catholics, for example. About 25,000 Catholics existed in the United States, uh, or I should say in America at the time of the, of the American Revolution. Uh, probably about 1,500 of them in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then another 25,000 living in present-day Canada, or what at the time was known as New France, uh, which also extended up and down the Mississippi River Valley into Louisiana. What about Jews? Uh, very, very small groups of Jews. Probably about 2,000 to 3,000 Jews existed uh, in the 13 colonies prior to 1776. Uh, in the, in the Dutch period in New York in the 1640s, uh, there is a small congregation of about 20 to 21 Sephardic Jews. Uh, they quickly leave uh, in the 1650s and 60s. Uh, they're persecuted by the Dutch reformed leader there, Peter Stuyvesant, but they largely leave because uh, the English or the Dutch are going to control the trade routes and they can't pursue uh, their economic opportunity there. The, Dutch, uh, the Jews are very strongly present in Newport. I had the honor and the privilege to give a lecture uh, on the um, anniversary of Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, uh, which was one of the first, religious, uh, first uh, religiously free uh, colonies in, in North America. I had it two summers ago uh, at the Toro Congregation, which is the oldest standing Jewish congregation uh, in the United States. Savannah, Philadelphia, Baltimore, all saw small uh, pockets in colonial America uh, of Jews. Of course, you have slaves. Uh, probably we know that most of the slaves, anywhere between no, uh, nine, 70 to 90 percent of slaves, uh, have been Christianized uh, at the time of the uh, American Revolution. But there were also about 10 to 30 percent uh, who still embraced the Muslim faith that they had brought with them after being converted to Islam from Africa. 
Uh, so that is a significant uh, religious group uh, in the United States. Of course, slaves also brought with them their folk traditions from Africa. Uh, and those folk traditions became what we call syncretized and mixed with, cat, with, uh, with Christian views and with Muslim views to make a sort of Islamic culture among the slaves that was different than, say, Islamic cultures in Europe or in the Middle East. And then the Native Americans, with hundreds and hundreds of different gods and religious systems uh, and ways of being in the world and providing meaning in the world. Again, we see syncretism here. Christians being converted, Indians being converted by Christian missionaries and still holding on to much of their Indian culture and mixing it with Christians. Uh, add some more Europeans to the mix, like Unitarians in New England, uh, like a, a small percentage of skeptics or deists, as they were often referred to, and then mix in a little bit of those who practice what one historian has called popular religion, magic, the occult, astrology, witchcraft, sorcery. Yes, these people existed in those nice little 18th century communities that we visit when we go to Williamsburg and some other places. And you have a motley mix, if you will, as one historian called it, of religions, all existing side by side, all engaging uh, with one another in various different ways. Uh, hopefully, in these last five minutes, uh, and there are volumes written about this, I at least have convinced you that colonial America was a very, very religiously diverse place. And I don't just mean in terms of Christian diversity. Now granted, if we were then to zero our lens into those 13 colonies, we obviously can't ignore those 13 colonies. Those were the 13 colonies that rebelled. Uh, there, the diversity becomes uh, a little more limited. Certainly we have Protestants, certainly we have Catholics, certainly we have Jews, certainly we have Unitarians and skeptics and deists and people practicing magic and popular religion. But the 13 colonies are founded as an act of imperial power by the British government. It is British people, mostly English, who are the ones who are establishing these colonies, establishing the political authority in these colonies. And as a result, we cannot ignore the fact that Protestantism, the Protestantism of Great Britain, is going to come to dominate these colonies. The 13 colonies were largely Protestant institutions. And depending on where you went, they could be rather tyrannically Protestant institutions. If you were in 17th century New England and you were not a Congregationalist, you were most likely going to be kicked out of the colony where you'd be sent to Rhode Island or Rogue's Island, as the Puritans tended to call it, or somewhere else. Uh, if you were in Virginia and you embraced a form of Christian faith or a form of any other faith, other than the Church of England or the Anglican Church, there was a good chance you were going to suffer persecution and even physical persecution. Even the Quakers, who created here in Pennsylvania William Penn's so-called holy experiment, limited participation in politics and in government to only Protestants. I'll say a little bit more about that or perhaps maybe in the discussion that follows. So when we then get to 1776, when we think about the founding fathers who are going to declare independence, write the Declaration of Independence, frame the Constitution, lead a revolution. We cannot ignore the fact that, as a good historian, I cannot ignore the fact that they were the products of an overwhelmingly British Protestant culture. Now again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were devout Protestants. Some of them were, some of them won't weren't. I always get on my students about this when they say, well, the founding fathers believed about religion as if 
they all had the exact same position in terms of their own personal faith or the role of faith in public life. So when we look at the Founding Fathers, we are apt to find um, evangelical Christians among them. Patrick Henry, for example, Samuel Adams, John Jay, John Witherspoon, the president of Princeton, the only minister to sign the Declaration of Independence, would have all identified in one way or another with evangelical Christianity. You have others who were skeptics, people like Thomas Jefferson, who rejected the Christian belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ethan Allen, Thomas Paine, uh, these men very, very much questioning, and not only just questioning, but in some cases outright attacking, as Thomas Paine did in his book, The Age of Reason in the 1790s, what would have been known at the time as Orthodox Christian faith. You had a group of what, for lack of a better term, might be called moral Anglicans, right? People who were raised in the Anglican church, uh, you know, occasionally went to services um, and believed that religion, the purpose of Christianity, was to teach good morality. Uh, George Washington, who is very, very difficult to figure out in terms of his religious faith, uh, would have probably fallen into this category. You have another category of founders who might be referred to as uh, what one scholar has called theistic rationalists. People who believe in the existence of a god and believe in the existence of an active God who intervenes into human affairs providentially, but certainly did not incarnate himself into the form of a man to die for the sin of the world. John Adams might fall into this camp. Benjamin Franklin might fall into this camp. The founders were very, very diverse in their own religious beliefs. But one thing they were unified around was what to do with religion in public life. Now, before I get to that, one caveat. When we think about the, when these debates happen on, uh, on uh, you know, CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, and I think I covered all the political angles there, right? Uh, when these debates take place and we see these talking heads debating, you know, was, were we a Christian nation? Were we a secular nation? Were we a religiously free nation? What kind of nation did the founders propose? I often cringe when I see that as a historian. Not because, well, I cringe because usually it's an ugly debate, and usually both sides get a lot of the history wrong. Right? But I also cringe when I see those debates because we are often led to believe on this question of what the founders believed about religion. We're often led to believe that somehow the American Revolution was a religious event. Did religion have something to do with it? Was religion important in the coming of the revolution? Did ministers and pastors and others, uh, rabbis and priests, did they take a side one way or another? Of course they did. But ultimately, the American Revolution was a political event, not a religious event. The Founding Fathers were all what we call Republicans. Now, caveat again. I'm using the term Republican here as a political philosophy, the small r Republicans, right? A Republican is someone who believed that we should be creating a Republican form of government or a republic. Republicans in the 18th century, the Republican Party as we know it today, of course, didn't exist, right? Um, Republicans read people like Plato on the Republic. They read uh, Machiavelli. They read Renaissance writers. They read all kinds of people who were political philosophers to say, well, what is a Republic and how does one establish a Republic? Now, on one level, a republic, if I ask my students what a republic is, the first thing they normally say is a representative form of government, right? And they're correct. But a republic in the 18th century mindset of a founding father was so much more. Because a republic required to them a certain ethic, 
a certain moral code, a certain moral practice, which they called virtue. Now again, when we think about the term virtue, we often try to understand, we often think about virtue through the Victorian age, right? We think about novels and, and women being virtuous and so forth. Virtue in the 18th century was very much a masculine term and it was very much connected to citizenship. In other words, a virtuous person was a good Republican because a virtuous person was willing at times to sacrifice his own interests for the greater good of the Republic. Again, I'll say that again because I think it's important. The founders were trying to cultivate citizens that were willing to sacrifice their own interests, their own self-interests, their own wants, desires, lusts, passions for the greater good of the nation. Benjamin Rush, for example, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a Philadelphia doctor who talk about religious diversity, uh, went back and forth in his life between evangelical Protestantism, liberal Protestantism, deism, Unitarianism. Benjamin Rush said, we should be teaching religion in public schools because religion teaches people to be politically virtuous. It teaches them to sacrifice their interests to something higher, their God. And people who are willing to sacrifice their interests for their God or something greater than them may also be ideal candidates for sacrificing their self-interest for the greater good of the nation. And that's why we should be teaching religion in public schools because religion teaches this kind of self-sacrifice. Now here's the kicker. Rush then went on to say, I don't care if that religion is the religion of Confucius, the religion of Muhammad, the religion of the Pope or the, the, the papacy. It doesn't matter to me. The Hindu religion he mentions. As long as that religion is teaching people to self-sacrifice for the greater good of the nation, I think we should be teaching it. Now, to be fair to Rush and to be fair to the historical record, he then goes on to say, as any 18th century person probably would have, but of course, the most honored religion would be the religion of Christianity. So take that for what it's worth, but that's, he's a product of the 18th century, right? So, the founders, some of them had use for religion, some of them didn't. If there was a religion that could teach people to be good citizens, the founders wanted to promote it. But ultimately, they were not in the business of talking about religion because uh, they wanted to get people closer to God, or they wanted to have them saved, or they wanted to somehow um, you know, prepare them for eternal life, or make them good, good uh, you know, Christians or Jews or Catholics. The founders were interested in religion and talked about religion because they believed that religion could be useful for the nation. Now, in the parts of the world where I live, over on the West Shore, at a place called Messiah College, where there's a lot of Anabaptists over there, and we don't fly an American flag because the Anabaptists believe that the kingdom of God is more important than the nation, there's a lot of people who would take umbrage with that idea. Because rather than religion serving as some kind of a prophetic voice to critique the nation, which show you where you've gone astray, for the Founding Fathers, religion was intricately bound to the building of a republic, to the building of a nation. It was not, mean to be a, it was not meant to be a prophetic voice to show the nation where they're going wrong. It was meant to work very closely with the nation. So just to repeat that point, the Founding Fathers did not believe that the American Revolution was a religious event, but certainly religion could be useful in creating the kind of republic they wanted to create. So these questions about, you know, are we a Christian nation? Are we a secular nation? Are we a religiously free nation? These are certainly questions that the Founding Fathers took up and wrestled with. 
But they were not the ultimate questions because the founding fathers were not members of the clergy. They were not ministers. They were people trying to construct the republic. Now, if you look at some of the founding documents, if you look at the, the, the uh, documents that these founders created, I think you can see uh, this, this idea very clearly. Of course, we have the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence mentions God four times, or references God four times. That God is a very vague God. That God can certainly be, not be defined in any way, shape, or form as a Christian God. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a God who is the author of natural rights within that document. There is a creator God mentioned in that document. There is a God who will judge mentioned in that document. And there is a God who is providentially involved in the affairs of human beings in that document. This is references to God that deists, that Jews, that Catholics, that Christians, uh, anyone from the sort of uh, Judeo-Christian tradition or someone who was shaped by the Judeo-Christian tradition could embrace. So clearly, the founders did have some concept of God. They were in what we call theists. They believed there was an active God shaping the universe. Obviously, this God judged. This God could intervene in human affairs. But that's all they mentioned about this God. Now, when you get to the Constitution, some 11 years later, uh, it's fascinating to me that there, is all, there are no mentions of God in the United States Constitution. God is never mentioned. The Constitution is a godless document. It mentions religion once, as it's originally framed in 1787. And it says in Article 6, there will be no religious test for office holding. In other words, you cannot hold, if you hold federal office, you can hold federal office no matter what your religious beliefs are or if you have no religious beliefs at all. This is Article 6. Now, when the Ten Amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, are added, of course, then you have the First Amendment which does talk about the disestablishment of religion. There will, be not, there will be no religion that will be the established church, much like, say, the Anglican Church in England or the Catholic Church in France. So I think this is important to realize. The founders were clear that your tax money would not be going to support some kind of religious organization. And then, of course, also in the First Amendment, we have the so-called free exercise clause, the right of all human beings within the bounds of the law to practice their faith or no faith at all in the way that they see fit. So I think when George Washington becomes president uh, in 1788-89, the first president, you begin to see this. One of the first acts Washington does as president is he writes letters to virtually every religious group in the United States. Catholics, all the Protestant denominations. Uh, the famous letter to the Jews at Newport uh, in which he says that they are free to worship under their own vine and fig tree. He even writes a letter to a small little sect based in Baltimore and scattering throughout the Mid-Atlantic known as the Swedenborgian Church. Now, could the Founding Fathers have imagined the religiously diverse country that we live in today? This is the real sticking point. This is the big question, right? What does the Founding Fathers' commitment to religious freedom, how does that translate to a post-9-11 world? And there, it gets a little more difficult to figure out. Because we know, for example, and maybe we can explore this a little bit more uh, in our discussion uh, after this, we know, for example, that in many of the state constitutions, the shapers of these constitutions, let's take Pennsylvania, for example, were very, very limited about who could participate in the political process. Certainly, anyone could worship freely without government intervention in Pennsylvania, but only Protestants 
And only those who could uphold the divine inspiration of the Old and New Testaments and actually obeyed the Christian Sabbath, so three things, you had to be a Protestant, affirm the inspiration of the Old and New Testament, and uphold the Christian Sabbath, could participate in government. This is where it gets a little messy, because not all the colonies were, were states, the colonies now states, were like Pennsylvania. In Virginia, of course, you have Thomas Jefferson and James Madison championing absolute religious freedom, the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty, as it's known. And in that text, Thomas Jefferson said, all people have the right to worship God freely, and all people have the right to participate in public life and the political process regardless of their religious faith. Now, what's fascinating about the Virginia story is this. On multiple occasions, you see Virginians making gestures to the future, suggesting that religious freedom does not just apply to the religious groups that are present in the United States in the 1780s, but apply to religious groups uh, that we know were not present yet in the United States. So for example, uh, in a letter that Jefferson writes, uh, he mentions that uh, religious freedom must be extended to those who follow Muhammad, to Hindus, to infidels, and to Christians. Now, good luck finding a Hindu in 18th century Virginia. You are not going to find one because they have yet to come into the country. Uh, good luck finding a free Muslim. You are not going to find one in colonial Virginia. But yet Jefferson, and not only in this letter, but also in his own autobiography, which is unpublished, makes these gestures to say true freedom applies to all the religions of the world, and it is implied that all of these religions will be welcome in the United States. And of course, as um, David mentioned in his introduction, this reflects Jefferson's, and to some extent Madison's, lifelong fascination with world religions um, and, and his interest in the Koran uh, and so forth. William Henry Lee, I'm sorry, Richard Henry Lee, some of you may not know him. Uh, he's the guy who ran on a road on horseback from Philadelphia back to Virginia in June of 1776 to try to get the Virginia Assembly to support a, a, a Declaration of Independence from the famous Lee family of Virginia. Some of you are Civil War buffs, are familiar with the Lee family uh, in Virginia. This is one of his, uh, I think it's his grandfather. Richard Henry Lee, when he returns to Philadelphia, said, Virginia is on board, that's my phrase, but here's the quote. We are willing to defend freedom, and that freedom embraces the Mahometist, the Christian, and the Hindu. And we could make multiple lists, especially in Virginia, of people writing letters to support the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty, arguing that religious liberty should, should be applied to all the religions of the world, whether or not those religious groups happen to be in existence in the United States at the time. Now here's what's, again, a lot of things I think are fascinating, but here's what's also fascinating, right? When the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberty was written and put before the House, what was the House of Burgess, is now the Virginia Assembly in 1786, there was, an op there was opposition to it. The opposition to it came from a man you're all, from, maybe some of you are familiar with, Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry thought that Jefferson and Madison had gone way too far in giving such complete religious liberty. He still believed that government should have some kind of a role in monitoring and controlling religion. Henry proposed what became known as the General Assessment Plan, and it went something like this. 
The sheriff will come into town every day, every once a year, I should say, and collect the religious tax. The sheriff will then distribute that religious tax to the congregation that you tell him to distribute it to. So it's not as if all the money is going to one established church. Henry didn't like the Anglican church either. But it will go to the various different groups. And if you are not part of a church, your money will go towards poor relief to help the poor. Jefferson and Madison rejected Henry's general assessment because it was still government being involved in promoting religion through a tax. Now, here's the ironic, fascinating part. Jefferson, a skeptic. Madison, hard to figure out his religion, some type of nominal Christian, probably born Anglican, studied under John Witherspoon at Princeton, although uh, I would argue Witherspoon's influence didn't really stick on, on Madison. The support that Jefferson and Madison received came from largely evangelical Christians, Baptists and Presbyterian evangelicals in Virginia who were sick and tired of being persecuted throughout the whole colonial period by the Anglican Church. They were great defenders of religious freedom, evangelicals were. They wanted government out. They wanted to worship freely. And as a result, they were willing to support the religious freedom statue of Jefferson and Madison, despite the fact that Jefferson and Madison had fundamentally different views about things like the deity of Christ, the resurrection, and so forth. Very different story among American evangelicals today, uh, isn't it? But nevertheless, it is in the petitions that these evangelical Presbyterian and Baptists wrote to the assembly. They include all kinds of references to the world religions. We have our right here. We want our right to worship God freely as Bap evangelical Baptists and Presbyterians. And because of that, Hindus, Muhammads, followers of Confucius, uh, Catholics, Jews should have the same liberties that we do. Imagine a conservative evangelical making that statement in America post 9-11 today. Nevertheless, this was their understanding of religious freedom. So, in wrapping things up here, let me say that history and the study of history is in many ways a limited discipline. Uh, the 18th century world that the Founding Fathers lived in was very, very different than the world we lived in. We do have some signposts, though. We don't know what George Washington would have thought about contemporary religious groups today. We don't know how these groups, would, how these men would have responded to 9-11. We don't know what they would have thought about uh, the incredible diversity that occurs in, uh, now occurs in the United States, especially after the 1965 Immigration Act, which brought in thousands, if not millions, of non-Western immigrants into this country. We don't know how they would have responded. We like to say the past is a foreign country. They did things differently there. But if the past is in any way going to speak to the present, the founders have left us some guidelines, some signposts, some things to ponder and to wrestle with as we try to live together in a civil world and with our religious differences. And that is that these founders all championed religious freedom, they all believed that individuals had the right to worship God however they chose or to not worship God at all. And as I look back as an American historian on the 18th century, I'm comforted because the founder's vision, while not comprehensive, is probably a very, very good place for us to start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I want to just also point out that this sort of thinking surrounds us more than we often know. And the national song that we probably sing, Oh Beautiful, the Spacious Skies, 
Make sure that you cover the, um, make sure that you read the um, second and third verses. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self and country loved and mercy more than life. America, America, God, mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam, undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with sisterhood from sea to shining sea. I'd like to share a prayer for the human family. We have these red books of common prayer that those Anglicans still run around, like to share. Let me point out that that means that it's your prayer as well as mine. That's the gift of these books, is that we're sharing with our it's on page 815. And I invite you to read these two prayers with me. First is for the human family, number three. And when we get to this phrase, redeemed us through Jesus, your son, this is an interfaith gathering. And I would like us to just simply say, redeemed us through your love and care. Then we can all own it together. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through your love and gracious care. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Amen. Once again on page 833, we have this wonderful, you were a Christian, but I think it was way ahead of his time, St. Francis. I think this is a wonderful interfaith prayer that I'd like you to share with you. Page 8333 is prayer number 62. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. significant day, whatever the historical underpinnings of September 11th, whatever the future implications of that day, we cannot allow ourselves to forget that for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individuals in the United States and beyond, September 11th was and is a very personal tragedy. In the course of less than two hours in New York, Northern Virginia, and Western Pennsylvania, almost 3,000 persons were brutally murdered. Hundreds of thousands were terrorized. A small number of people, relatively speaking, lingered for weeks or months wounded after the attacks. Think what happens to you when you are on the ground and are splashed with hot jet fuel from a plane that hits a tower hundreds of feet above your head. For tens of thousands of family members, at least, 
a loved one went off to work that day and simply disappeared. What did it mean for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who saw the smoke rising from the towers for days afterwards as they gradually realized they were seeing the smoke of a funeral pyre? Too often our examination of these events in their historical context serves to protect us from fully grasping their human impact. But 3,000 individual violent deaths create, all, create a human impact which stretches around the world and into our entire future. In the words of the Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai, the diameter of the bomb was 30 centimeters, and the diameter of its effective range about 7 meters with four dead and eleven wounded. And around these, in a larger circle of pain and time, two hospitals are scattered in one graveyard. But the young woman who was buried in the city she came from, at a distance of more than a hundred kilometers, enlarges the circle considerably, and the solitary man mourning her death at the distant shores of a country far across the sea includes the entire world in the circle. And I won't even mention the howl of orphans that reaches up to the throne of God and beyond, making a circle with no end and no God. What God may or may not have to do with these events is a question that brings us back to the realm of abstract contextualization. I don't want to go there at this moment. Just take that home and expand it 3,000 times. Let's take a moment of silence. Remembrance of those who were murdered on that day. Is there anything that can comfort those who experienced such loss on that day? We have only words in our presence, our ability to remember and commitment to shape the future. We come together on this anniversary to remind ourselves and others of the teachings which move us to overcome violence. The human family is blessed with many teachings from many communities, from many parts of the world, which inspire us to move forward towards peace. Shalom, Salam, Shanti, Pax. Amen. We have a sign outside of this building. It's a very simple sign. God's peace to all who pass by. And as we go forth, my hope is that you will share that peace, remembering that you are a beloved child of God. And we have a witness, I think, in our relationships, both as nations as well as individuals. And I want to teach you the simple sign for you. Remembering that peace really means shalom, wholeness, Hardiness and healthiness. Put your palms together and you slide them through like that. And we say, as we gather, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And you may say to one another, and also with you. So let us go forth. We're going to be heading down the main aisle to the left. There's some steps to the undercroft. And then we will have um, some refreshments as well as some wonderful dialogue. So please join us. Practice, here we go.
Peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Let us go forth, share it. I am going to turn this over to Joyce Davis, um, who many of you know. Uh, she is been an ex she has extensive experience as an NPR consultant, a correspondent in uh, the Middle East and uh, in many other places, and she's much better at this than I am. Um, but uh, our our general rule of procedure here is going to be that after after each presentation. Uh, Joyce will direct several uh, questions to uh, the presenter and then after all three presentations uh, Joyce will direct any further questions she has and then open it for questions and answers to um, to the, the all, all of you who are here and we are aiming to uh, to uh, bring, an, bring an end to this um, no later than five o'clock, preferably earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say that I, I found uh, the, the remarks, the keynote, quite provocative and quite enlightening because there was a lot of information there for us to digest and for us to pull apart in our discussions. But we are privileged to have several people that will join in at least the official conversation, but you should be getting your questions together right now because we really want this to be a discussion uh, so that we can all at least, you know, delve into this most important topic. So we have uh, to my left here, uh, Imam, Talha Ali, who is um, with the Fazl Mosque of Washington, D.C., and uh, the National Public Affairs Team of the Ahmadiyya community. So we're really delighted to have you here. Welcome. And of course, an old friend, we know him very well, another provocative scholar, uh, Dr. Richard Hughes, who is uh, Messiah College Distinguished Professor of Religion, retired, and he's the author of several, several books, including Christian America and the Kingdom of God, and he will, I'm sure, have some enlightening comments to offer. And of course, our keynote, Dr. John Fia, uh, who has just raised an number, I think he clarified for me that one of the questions I had is whether most of the Founding Fathers really were aware of all of the different religions, and you made that perfectly clear. We were in a diverse society, diverse cultures, diverse religions, and that they were aware of these, so they could have founded a nation that was Christian. They were aware that there were these other faiths, so they could have simply said this is going to be a Christian nation. But the first question I'd like to throw out at you, because we really do want to delve into this in an honest way, what is the support that people who say this was founded as a Christian religion, where are they getting their support from? What is it that would lead them to believe that this nation should be a Christian nation? You want to start and then we'll work our way down. Would you like to start? Sure. And then we'll go to Dr. Hughes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and my book, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation, actually uh, sprung from some, some things that I hear all the time in my own religious community uh, as an evangelical Christian. Uh, and I just, a lot of my uh, fellow evangelicals get this very, very wrong uh, on this front uh, and just do sloppy history simply because they are looking to history, not try to try to understand history in all its fullness, but to try to cherry pick what's useful for them to promote a, use history to promote a political agenda. And I don't think that's a very good use of history. But the question, why, you know, what's the argument? Yeah. Um, several, several arguments. One is, uh, and, and they would be right. It's a dem there's a demographic argument to make. Uh, in other words, the population of America at the time of the founding is overwhelmingly Christian. Uh, and if you want to say, was America a Christian nation based on demographics alone, not only say that they were in the 18th century, but they have always been, if you were to define Christianity broadly in terms of Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox. So, so that's part of it. Um, I think getting into some of the historical details, though, I think the strongest argument that they make, and I referenced this a little bit in my talk, is the, uh, the state constitutions. Now, in a lecture, a lecture like this, I focused on Virginia, 
although I did mention Pennsylvania, uh, the majority of the colonies, after they became states, formed obviously their own state constitutions. These state constitutions had a lot of power, much more power in the 18th century than they do today, simply because there was no strong national government. There was an Articles of Confederation in which each state had its own power. With the exception of Virginia and with the exception of Rhode Island, all of these states either A, have clearly Christian, even Protestant tests for holding office, you have to be a Protestant, you have to uphold the divine inspiration of the Old and New Testaments. Or they have Christian establishments, meaning if you go, Massachusetts and Connecticut, for example, your taxpayer money goes to pay for the congregational churches in those states, whether you're a congregationalist or not, in Massachusetts all the way up to 1833. So when they look at this past, they say, well, you know, these are the promoters of Christian America. Well. You know, yes, the, the, the Constitution says, you know, no, no uh, religious tests or there's no establishment. But locally, clearly, these founders who created these state constitutions believed that they were creating Christ, uniquely Christian societies. Or, and, and while they upheld religious freedom, they certainly believed that only Christians, Protestants in some cases, should be allowed to make government decisions. I think that's a strong point that you see people like David Barton, if that name rings a bell to you, and other Christian nationalists making in the public square today. Dr. Hughes, you want to take that well, one? Yeah. And, and if we all, I mean, your definition of a Christian can be a little bit uh, more provocative. I mean, did they all have the same definition of what a Christian is? You know, the well, serving the poor and the... John, uh, in his lecture, John uh, pointed out that the founders viewed religion as central to the foundation of this republic because religion would support this kind of moral virtue that he discussed. And that is certainly true. And when you read the documents, you, you read them, you, 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 you hear them speaking of the importance of religion. And that brings me to this point. One of my old professors at the University of Iowa, Sidney Mead, in one of his books tells about, and I'm, this comes from literature somewhere, and I'm, I'm not sure where Mead picked this up, the Parson Thwackham. Do you know about this? No. Where they, where they, but anyway, Parson Thwackham said, when I say religion, I mean Christianity. And when I say Christianity, I mean Protestantism. And when I say Protestantism, I mean the Anglican Church. Well, you know, but I think it's that kind of thinking that's going on among some of the, these defenders of Christian America. They go to the documents and sure enough, it is religion. Religion is central to, to the thinking of so many of these founders. And they simply jump from that, well, religion must mean Christianity because that's the religion we know. And there's so much more that can be said, but that's at least one point. Well, that'll get us started. When you hear this, Imam, as a Muslim, I, I mean, how do you feel? Clearly, you have found some sense of religious freedom here, but hearing about the history and hearing about people talk about Christian America, how do Muslims feel about that? First of all, uh, as far as how do Muslims think about it, we very clearly understand what religious freedom means and what America has to offer. I myself am from Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and those who are aware of our community, we are a very persecuted community in a, a large part of the world. And coming to America and having that religious freedom tells us that America was not founded on the basis of, of religion, or there is religious freedom in America. But I do understand where these people are coming from. So let me give example of only one Islamic country to highlight my point. Pakistan, where I was born, uh, was created on a very secular base. Pakistan was supposed to be a secular country. The very first speech given by the founder of Pakistan was the Hindus are able, Hindus are allowed to uh, worship their own religions, Muslims are allowed to worship their own religions, Jews, Zoroastrians, Christians, and so on and so forth. But within a matter of three to four years, the right wing or the religious wing, they took over the country. And they were able to change that country. And as uh, the two esteemed historians have mentioned, that there are certain tidbits in history which do suggest that 
America was created on a religious basis. And so was Pakistan. Pakistan was created for the Muslim majority of the people. And people, the religious right, they took that small tidbits of history, took it out of context, and because they were able to become powerful, they were able to change the constitution of the country. But by, the, by God's grace, this has not happened in America. And this is why we enjoy so much religious freedom, not only for, my, not only for Christians, but for all the different denominations of different religions which are found in America. Um, before I go out to cry, I want to just throw one other thing at you. Um, when you get into the philosophy of, of America and democracy, I mean, I was impressed to see that at least Thomas Jefferson really did study the Quran and studied other religions and had a kind of broad, broader world view. But was that the case for the rest? Uh, is American democracy, has it been infused with thinking, with philosophies from different religions? You mentioned Judeo-Christian, but could Islam have also in some ways, because I believe in some building there are even inscriptions from the Quran um, in, the, in the capital or somewhere, right? I mean, in DC I've heard that there are inscriptions. Is, can we say that actually we are the beneficiaries of a kind of multi-faith thinking? Well, that's a tough question. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, tough, a tough and complex argument to make. There has actually been a new book out I'm blanking on the name of the author right now, but it's on Jefferson and uh, and uh, Islam. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big trade book. You could probably find it at Barnes and Noble or something. And I haven't read the book, so I don't know the argument, but the author makes the argument that while Jefferson clearly drew upon traditional Western, whether it be Christian or Enlightenment ideas, uh, his study of Islam especially um, may have informed his commitment to religious freedom in the way that it did, and his study especially of Islamic history. Now, again, I haven't read the book, so I don't know, um, but this is the way it seems a lot of scholars right now are moving to try to figure out what the, what the interaction was, what the contact is, not only with Islam, but you know, how does a day-to-day -day interaction with mm -hmm. slaves or how does the da slave religion, or how does a daily or, or interaction between missionaries and Native Americans on the frontier? We always we we think about the one-way street, right? The Christian missionaries converting the Native Americans to Christianity, but now historians are beginning to think about well, what ways does Native American religion somehow influence Christianity or influence these kinds of it? So, so we're still very early in that kind of discussion, but. Um, Maybe one of my colleagues can add to it. Uh, but for me right now, it's hard to say that anything other than Christianity and Western culture and Western intellectual life informed the founding. But I'm open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're all, historians are all revisionists. We wait for new information and then we change our, our position. <laughs> I think one of the most important things I heard John say in his lecture, he said early on, and he said, even though the founders were typically broad in their thinking, they were all products of this Anglo-Christian, Judeo-Christian world. That's very, very important. And, and even though uh, the founders did not attempt to set up a Christian nation, and in fact drew up documents to prevent that, as in the First Amendment, it's still the case that this nation has been profoundly shaped by Judeo-Christian values. Well, there's just no way around that. Uh, so I think then Joyce's question is, well, what are some of the other values that may have figured in? And as John says, we're early in that game, but it'll be interesting to, to see how that unfolds. Hey, Mama, are there Muslim values that you would see that at least are reflected in what's become known as American democracy? Absolutely. And uh, almost, uh, and again, from historical point of view, it's very hard to say whether it was directly taken by the religious founders from Islam. But to think in an even broader point of view, a Renaissance uh, or the uh, Age of Reason came through the translation of the Greek work and through the trans through Islamic work. And that Age of Reason that connected with the f uh, founding fathers of creating America. So the Islamic teachings or Islamic uh, uh, philosophy which translated into Age of Reason or Renaissance then translated into America. As far as I see any similarities between the Islamic teachings and the Constitution of America, yes, everything. Islam teaches, the, uh, Islam teaches uh, freedom of religion. Uh, as uh, Dr. Fayel was mentioning, this, uh, 
historically, they have learned a lot. So the very first charter signed by Prophet Muhammad when he migrated to Medina was with the Jews and the idol worshippers of the city. And the charter signed was that the Jews are, have the right to practice their own religion, idol worshippers have the right to practice their own religion. The only thing I ask of you is when the city is attacked, we have to fight together. So this was a first, de first democratic charter signed by the Prophet Muhammad. And you mentioned the theory of virtue. Theory of virtue is almost exactly the same in the Holy Quran as well. That you're supposed to uh, sacrifice your individual self for the uh, role of greater good. So I'm not sure whether there was a direct influence from a historical point of view, but it makes sense that when Islam translated into Renaissance, that Renaissance translated into America. I think you raise a very good point there. Most Americans and people in the West don't acknowledge the tremendous role that Islam and Iranian culture played on ancient Greece, the foundation of Western philosophy, and on many other aspects of Western society, European society in particular. So, I mean, that I'm hardly an expert in ancient, but clearly these, these worlds, because Iran was a dominant power at the time of, uh, you know, when, when we were looking at Greece as the foundation of, of, uh, of civilization. So. Yeah, and this gets to the way I think everybody, all three, the, 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 we think about things. You know, I'm, as a historian, I'm open to agreeing with you. I, I need the so-called, you know, connection, mm -hmm. right? And that's where I'm saying, well, Jefferson read the Quran. What does that mean? Um, so I would, I would certainly argue all those things you're saying about Islam with virtue and so forth. I would say, I would say Islam is certainly compatible with. Um, but as a historian, I need, the, I need to also have the minutia connecting. I want to see those patterns of, okay, well, this person read. You know, those, but but yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just a different way of, of analyzing data as a historian. Yeah. We ready to take some questions from the audience? Is there anything that you don't quite understand? Yes. Would you agree? You want the... Does someone want to pass okay. it around? Is it mobile? Or... Would you agree that many of the founding fathers were students of Enlightenment philosophy, Spinoza? Hobbes, Locke, uh, and how would that contrast, how would that philosophy contrast with either Muslim philosophy or Judeo-Christian philosophy as far as, uh, give me a basis for self-government in any of, any of those, uh, uh, it, the theology of any of those religions. Thank you. Um, you mentioned various uh, philosophers from the early modern philosoph philosophical area. Um, some of their, some of them might completely disagree with the Islamic teachings, and some of them might uh, agree with them. So it depends, right? So you go from Hobbes, who believed in a, uh, in a, uh, who believed that there has to be a sovereign. He believed that like, you know, there it should be not a divine right, so, so to speak, but there should be one ruler. Then you move to Descartes, who believes in uh, who believes in God. Then you move towards Hume, who believes, who supposedly believes in God, but then he also creates doubt in the creation of God. So it's I think it becomes it goes from case by case basis that some philosophers they agree with and some philosophers they might not. As far because the, even the early modern philosophy they have different uh, Machiavelli has a different thought process about how the government should be run, Hobbes has a different process, and so on and so forth. Um, and some of them agree with Islam, and some of them don't. I'm not sure how much influence uh, they had. But, but also speak to, I mean, the Islamic idea of self-governance. Even the lawyer Jirga in Afghanistan is a form of that, of, of communities coming together to make their own decisions in a consensual basis. Very good. Uh, so the Islamic way of government, if I'm to speak on that, Islamic give, a way of government is essentially a secular way of government. Um, unfortunately, the lines become very blurred only after 50 to 100 years after the demise of Prophet Muhammad. And uh, even in the beginning, the lines are a bit blurred just because uh, the Prophet was himself a ruler and, uh, and also as a, a messenger, a prophet. And, but if you it was always a democratic government in the sense that all the people had the rights to not only worship their religion, but also live their life according to their religion. One small example of that would be 
that the Jews of Medina were not judged according to so-called Sharia law. You know, we have this fear of Sharia law that if Sharia law comes in one country or Islamic law comes in one country, everyone would be beheaded. But the Prophet Muhammad, in his life, he when he when he he was also a judge, and when he judged the Jews, he judged them according to Torah. He judged them according to Old Testament. So it was a very secular form of government. As far as being a democratic form of government, there is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad which says that there is no leadership, there is no khilafat, caliphate, without consultation. So Islam from the very beginning has had a consultative body. Whether you call it parliament, whether you call it senate, but Islam has always uh, suggested that a khilafat or supreme leadership cannot work without a consultative body working together, a parliament working together with that leader. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you all with us. Thank you for all of your sharings. I ponder about just sort of the basic understanding of sin as being one of the great gifts that all the founding fathers seemed to get, whether they were good in church school and their Anglican heritage or whether they came from any other area. And I'm, I'd love to have some conversation about um, that. As, as I've spoken with my Islamic friends, they don't understand original sin, but they do say that we do forget our original blessedness. I don't know if that's accurate, but that was the way it was described to me when I was on, when I was on, on Long Island. Um, the good news for me is also that the Anglican Church continued to change, and actually we began having bishops by ballot in 1786. So we have this understanding of authority that was just, just, just talked about that's very different than the way it was in England. Um, and I think that seems to be part of what we're describing. And even the, you know, as the country's evolving, religions are evolving. And that democratic tendency seems particularly understanding sin, understands we need to have a check and balance with one another. That we really need to not have that top-down authority structure. Would you all be able to speak to how that might play out in your different faiths? Oh, right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, the, the founding fathers, you know, it depends which founding father you're talking to. Uh, some would some would have a very clear view of sin. You know, John John Witherspoon would be happy to lecture you on the total depravity of man, and the <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a paradox because the fa many of the founders were also deeply influenced by the Enlightenment, which gave them a very optimistic view. Uh, of human beings. You know, the human beings can create this kind of democratic society. But on the other hand, people, like you take Ben Franklin, for example. I mean, Ben Franklin, even though he rejects the Puritanism, the, the Calvinism, right, the total depravity he learned from his father growing up in Puritan Massachusetts, I would argue there's still this kind of cultural sense that human beings are flawed um, as a result of their nature, whether it be, you know, he probably would hesitate from connecting it to the fall, you know, or, you know, you, you know, the Anglican church, certainly people like Washington and Jefferson were brought up within this culture. Uh, John Adams, who rejects a lot of his Puritan faith, still has this sort of very pessimistic view of, of human beings. And I think you're exactly right uh, to connect. Uh, this may have, I'll, I'll say, this may have had something to do with the Constitution and tyranny and uh, authority that takes away individual rights is the product of a sinful culture. The founding fathers, or, or so the pessimistic view of man uh, and women. So I think the founding fathers, there's something to the fact that the founding fathers in a sort of general sense uh, established a system of checks and balances within the Constitution, uh, realizing that as James Madison put it in Federalist 10, paper number 10, all human beings are driven by uh, factions and self-interest. And these self-interests are, this idea of self-interest is embedded into the very nature of man, he says. So let's establish a government in which we let all the self-interests bloom, because they're gonna bloom anyway. But let's have a government to control so that one self-interest does not trump the others. Because when one self-interest trumps the others, you basically have tyranny 
which is what you just fought a war, a revolution against. So I think whether you want to call it sin, whether you want to call it a, a pessimistic view of human beings, uh, or the idea that human beings are prone towards self-interest as opposed to virtue, um, I, I think you're onto something there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, Rabbi. What are we missing by not thinking about or talking about the English Civil Wars of the 1600s and the, the thinking that's coming out of that whole period, which in some ways the American political structure is is a um, just just following further development, following the logic out of. I mean, the 1600s when, first of all, e England has all of these, well, these religious as well as political wars and divisions, and I think that's when the divine right of kings is finally, for once and for all, challenged, and so, and. And all of this is then being taught in colleges in Harvard and Princeton and William and Mary. And we miss it. Okay, the question in the bow that we're missing uh, is, uh, is there any impact of the 1600s and the war, religious wars, does that have any impact on the no, foundation? I, I just think that all this political thought, which has separated divine right from government, already developing in the okay. 1600s. And you want to take that, uh, Dr. Hughes? Sure. Uh, well, I, you know, I, there, there's a very real sense in which the American form of government is rooted in a response against those religious wars. So in the 17th century, 1600s, the Thirty Years' War on the Continent, you know, Christians killing Christians because they can't agree on religion. Uh, likewise in England, the Puritan Revolution. And uh, thoughtful people, and I'm thinking now of uh, a man by the name of Herbert of Sherbury, who writes a book in response to all of this. He calls it De Veritate, the truth. And he, and he says that he said the truth is simply this, that, that the Bible is a very, very complex book. I mean, think about it. But I mean, before the Reformation, the Bible was not an open book. So there's, there's no wonder that they could preserve religious uniformity. But beginning with in the early 16th century, not only the Reformation, but the printing press is so the, the scriptures now is being distributed, and people are reading it and they're judging it for themselves, and we're off to the races. And now in the 17th century, we get these religious wars. And so the 18th century, the way I've always taught my students is, the 18th century is, is the age of reason, which in many respects is a rejection of the religious wars and an effort to say the Bible, or any text for that matter, is going to be, a, any written text, will be a very complex book open to interpretation on the part of people who read it. So Herbert of Sherbury says, the fact of the matter is God has written a second book as well. And this, and this is very much a response to these religious wars. And he, and he says this second book is open to any person who wishes to read it. And it's clear, and it's simple, and you can't get it wrong. And the second book is the book of nature that we all can read. And he says nature tells us, now we wouldn't all agree with this today, but Herbert thought nature tells us there is a God. I mean, how do you look at nature around you and conclude there's no creator? And nature tells us that there's a difference between right and wrong, human conscience, etc. And he says these are the fundamentals of every religion. So let's take all these biblical arguments, you know, about the Virgin Mary or the Pope or should we be baptized or what form of baptism or church organization. Put them, you'll know, put those arguments on the sidelines, and let's put front and center this notion of nature's God. And so. In the Declaration of Independence, John mentioned that, that Jefferson appeals to God in the Declaration four times. And he specifically qualifies, he never says the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He never says that. He says nature 
and nature's God. God. Yeah. The God we know through nature. And that's the kind of religious vision that the nation was built on, it seems to me. And very much a rejection of all these arguments that, that yielded up these wars that you're talking about, Rabbi Chopper, of, of the 17th century. Yes. Um, oh, oh, sorry, you want to come? Go ahead. Just to add to that yeah, quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this gets to the question before about Spinoza and all of the, the enlightenment in America is very much embedded at every point with religion. So you can have a God who is providentially in control of all things, and yet that God has now entrusted human beings with natural laws and a common sense of humanity, a sort of moral sense, a moral conscience, and so forth, to live at civil society. Uh, so you can have a, you could still have a belief in a God, like I think most of the founding fathers did, but still, but still appeal to natural law or moral sense or so forth. Now, real quick about the 17th century wars, uh, there are parts of New England, uh, and especially among Calvinists, Presbyterians in the middle colonies where we are today in, in, in New England, which what I find over and over again, I'm writing a book now about religion and the American Revolution that's a little different than the Christian America book. I find over and over again uh, kind of conservative Calvinist ministers in the 18th century constantly appealing to the English Civil War and the Oliver Cromwell's overthrow of the of the king, you know, as a model for the American Revolution. So, you know, th this is what we should be doing, you know, because we uh, they overthrew tyranny and they believe God was on their side, and we believe God is on our side, and over and we need to overthrow tyranny as a result. Now, that's just one stream of many, but it's amazing how much this comes up with uh, with 18th century ministers. You know, what's interesting, I think, about this discussion, too, is that in our world, where we're looking at all of the divisions within Islam, and we're looking, I have written that there's a war within Islam going on, a war for, for, to really determine what Islam stands for. And we're seeing that with the beheadings, we're seeing that people misusing the name of Islam, right? Um, but one of the questions, I mean, clearly it should, as we look back to history and, and what Christian, Christians have gone through, even in modern, allegedly modern times, the wars, we can better understand what the Islamic world is going through. And it is a newer religion than, than Christianity. Yes, sir. My question to especially Imams are... My question is this, that uh, as I'm, as a student or as a learner, that within Islam, I have seen many, many sects. So what is, when the printing press came in 1600, so is that different Qurans published and because of that many sects, what is the message of Islam and Prophet Muhammad for the Muslims and for the world? And is there any impurity in it, like uh, with the printing press and with different thoughts? Or what is the speciality in Islam and what is the meaning of Islam? Wow, an easy question. <laughs> Okay, the meaning of Islam, Imam will tell us. <laughs> wow. That's a deep one. Okay, uh, so let me answer all of them one by one quickly. <laughs> he so said first, we're leaving at five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Islam literally means uh, to peace, uh, Islam literally means peace and submission. These are two literal meaning. Arabic is a very different language. I think Hebrew is probably the only language which comes close to Arabic in this sense, that each of the Arabic letters are based on three letter roots. And each of that root has a specific meaning. So the root of Islam, which is also a root of salam and shalom in Hebrew, means peace and submission. So the meaning of Islam is to be, to be in peace with yourself and to submit to the will of God. So that is the literal meaning of Islam. Now as far as why are there so many different sects, because are there different Qurans, are there different narrations of the Prophet? All the Qurans are literally exactly the same. There's not even a dot that's different in any of the Quran, of the Quran which is read by the ISIS, or the Quran which is read by uh, Ahmadis, or uh, the Sunnis, or the Shias. The difference comes from the understanding of that Islam. And the problem is not even the meaning of the words, but how do you apply them? And your different philosophers we, you can call them saints, you can call them Sufis, but at their root they were philosophers. They were people who understood religion 
have translated the, uh, uh, the religion according to the needs of their time. People forget what was the circumstance of that time, and they try to implement that in your time. So for example, one of the saints who lived during the time of Genghis Khan said, this is time for jihad. I need to fight against Genghis Khan because Genghis Khan is attacking Baghdad. Uh, Baghdad. And this was his time period. Now people have taken that, ISIS has taken that, and has applied that to the time when we're living peacefully in a country which allows you religious freedom. You know, the founder of Ahmadiyya Muslim community was born in India under British rule in the 1800s. And at that time, all the, all the Muslims in British, or most of them, said, well, let's do a violent jihad against British government. And he said, no, the time period does not allow you to have a violent jihad, to have a, a violent uh, 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 uprising against the British government, because you have freedom of religion. The British government is allowing you to practice your religion according to the thing. If you're quoting Imam Ibn Qayyim, who is one of the philosophers, then you have to understand what was the uh, situation in his time. So most of the sectarian uh, differences come from either political reasons or because people have misunderstood some of the previous scholars and tried to implement their understanding which was specific to that time period, to the time they live in. That's great, but I think one of the questions too is that since the Quran is in Arabic, not everyone reads Arabic as a native language or fully or really understands it, and the Quran has not necessarily been translated into every dialect and every language. It's, it's, as we are now seeing that the, once the Bible started being translated in many different languages, there were many different interpretations, right? I don't think it has as much to do with the translations uh, of the Quran. Of course it does. And uh, the Ahmadiyya difference from like uh, other sects of Islam is literally based on three or four verses, where we translate the Quran differently. The rest of it is almost exactly the same. Um, and the translation of Quran has been done by our own community, at least, in more than 75 languages. So Quran has been translated into various languages. and. Uh, but it has been recently translated, so you're right, some of it might have to do with that. But I think it has to do, they might uh, translate the words as exactly the same. For example, let me give you a very simple example. La ikraha fiddin. There is no compulsion in religion. Now a non a non uh, a jihadist will also, I don't like to call him jihadist, an extremist, will translate it as saying no compulsion in religion as well. But he's saying once you become a Muslim, then I can't uh, do any compulsion to, for you to read five daily prayers. So the translation is still exactly the same. The problem is not from translation from Arabic to English as much, as much as to how they take it from there. Well, no, it's just that when I did the, some reporting on Muslim women, uh, it was, they told me that women were starting to speak up more for their rights because they were able to better read the Quran and to argue for themselves. So <laughs> at any rate, yes, Michael. Mm. I think we can, we can agree when we talk about what's in the Constitution that most of the Americans would agree that we're not about to have a state religion and we're not about to have a religious test for office. The problem we're having now is not with the First Amendment, which talks about that. It's with Jefferson's later uh, writing of the separation, the wall of separation between church and state. There's a whole bunch of misunderstanding going as in my humble view, all the way up to the nine Supreme Court justices who don't have a clear view of what that means. And my question is, how do you think that's going to go? The, the Jeffersonian view, and I assume most of the founding fathers had that, of the absolute wall of separation between church and state, how do you think that's going to play out in American society? Um, who wants to take it first? I always wonder about that because when you have God in your constitution, oh, well, you said it's not in the constitution, but when you have it on your money, you know, <laughs> God, we I mean, there isn't really a separation, or is there? That's the question. Yeah. Well, go ahead. I actually uh, understood Dave Messner to, to ask me to prepare a paper on this, which I did. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> but I'm going to just quickly, just because it's precisely on this point. Uh, in April of 2013, now this, I found this exceedingly startling. The Huffington Post published a story uh, under the question, uh, would Americans prefer an establishment of Christianity in the United States? 
And here was the question that was asked to people in the poll. Would you favor or oppose establishing Christianity as the official religion in your state? You ready for this? Yeah. 34% said they would favor that proposal. 19% were unsure. Only 47% said they would oppose such a move. And then the question, would you favor or oppose a constitutional amendment which would make Christianity the official religion of the United States? 32% said they would support such an amendment. 16% were unsure. Only 52%, a bare majority, said they would reject such an amendment. So I got to wondering, what has brought us to such a time? I mean, that would not have been true, I don't think, 50 years ago. And, you know, it, it occurred to, you know, and I'm just going to very quickly summarize this. I think, first of all, the whole notion of separation of church and state or separation of religion from the government is a pretty, pretty radical idea in light of world history. I mean, we've seen, for example, even in civilizations that have, Pakistan, it begins with this, but very quickly it moves the other direction. And so the fact that we've been able to sustain this as long as we have is pretty remarkable. Uh, I think one of the factors that makes this doctrine so vulnerable, it's made it vulnerable throughout American history, is the fact that Americans have such a meager, and I think John would agree with this because we see this in our students, a meager sense of history. I mean, Henry Ford said it best. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Henry, Henry, Ford, Henry Ford said it best. History is bunk. And that's sort of the typical American attitude. You might want to read a history book for entertainment, but you don't take it seriously. I mean, we live in the present, this sort of eternal present, one foot in the golden age of the past, that nature, nature's God, one foot in the golden age of the future, this grand millennium that we're ushering in. And history is just beside the point. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, again, I'm not going to read this, but I, I want to make sure I, I mention these, these points very quickly. Uh, the, the, the second point that I think, this, if, 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 this American amnesia, I think, too, is buttressed by the widespread loss of critical thinking in America's public square. And, and, I, and, you know, and I'm now retired from teaching, so I can say, say what I want to say. My son says, my son says, Dad, when you get to be 71, you can say whatever you damn well want to say, and no one can do anything about it. So, hey, so, but, but, the, but the colleges, the colleges and the universities in this country are at fault because they have allowed the professions really to squeeze out the liberal arts. So then I would even argue, John, and you may want to take me to task on this, but I would argue that most students who go to college, Messiah College, Penn State, you name it, most of them go to college to, in effect, learn a trade. They're not going to get educated. They're going to learn a trade to get their union card so they can make money when they get out. And the whole apparatus of, cri of critical thinking is just... So you've got this no sense of history, the undermining of, cri of critical thinking, and then the fourth point, it seems to me a really, really critical factor is the backlash that took place in this country in response to the 1960s on the part of conservative Christians. You know, the 1960s are challenging everything this nation held dear. Uh, the racial arrangement, you know, that was, that was traditional. The, the role of of minorities in this country, the role of women in this country, the role of war in this country, sexual mores, everything is under attack. And so many conservative Christians respond by affirming these traditional values, but then what do they do? They enshrine the traditional values in the sacred cloak of the Christian religion. And then they try to elect to office. I mean, in a way, it's almost an effort to create a sort of a quasi establishment. It wasn't an establishment, but you're trying to get Christians in office, Christians in the presidency, Christians in the Senate, Christians in the House of Representatives, Christians as the local mayor, this sort of, you know, Christian control of, of government and, and society. So with those four pieces of the puzzle as the backdrop, then think what it means 
when this nation is attacked. Now look, th think about this. We, we have fought many wars with nations that would call themselves Christian nations, even Nazi Germany. I mean, Christian nation, okay? Uh, Italy, Christian nation. I mean, you can run down the England, Christian nation. We, and we fought wars against nations that clearly subscribed to a religion other than Japan, for example, North Korea, uh, Vietnam, etc. But we, I don't think we've ever fought a war or, or, or had an enemy, I should put it this way, that A, subscribed to a religion that is not Christian, and B, uh, made it very clear that they are intolerant of other religions. Okay, now I'm thinking here about these, I'm not thinking about Islam, I'm thinking about these terrorists. You know, I mean, utterly in, intolerant of other, other religions. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever had the situation, so given the way this doctrine of separation from church and state has been steadily eroded. And given the fact that it's vulnerable anyway, under any circumstance, it's always vulnerable, but it's been eroded. Now we come to this point in American history, and the Huffington Post can take a poll, and you find a third of the American people saying, yeah, I'd go for a Christian establishment. I find that incredibly troubling, and, and it, it's kind of an alarm bell, and I mean, I think someone's got to think pretty seriously about you know, where are we going to be 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Are we going to be exactly where Pakistan went, you know, within a very short time after, you know, this? Yeah, exactly. Well, well, what you raise is really, it's the disconnect with, with history, the not understanding. And I remember one... Going. Yeah, go right there. I'm not going to preach like Richard. Uh, Richard's a preacher. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, I, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not a credi credible source. But I wrote my research paper in high school on the effect of uh, effect of Cold War on separation of church and state. Yeah. So what you were mentioning, uh, you mentioned we have the name of God on our currency. Mm -hmm. This was added during the Cold War, and it was a result to atheism of Cold War. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were saying that it was it's the first time we've seen this. I think we have witnessed something similar to this during Cold War. Where if under God, and under God, allegiance exactly. gets added in right. the exactly. yeah. right. And similar thing is happening. And this is a very common phenomenon in the history of the world. When people are scared, they try to go back to the roots of religion. Mm -hmm. And right now, there's a religious power, so-called religious power, fighting against America. And we want to associate ourselves with another religious power. These people who believe in Allah are fighting against us. Let's associate ourselves with Jesus. And this was something that happened not with Jesus, but with God against in Cold War because those people were atheists. If you were in America and you were a free thinker, you were, there's a witch hunt against you. Uh, the Salem uh, trials and so on and so forth. Uh, it is something very similar which happened in Cold War, I thought, I think, which is happening again, but on a much larger scale uh, as a backlash to what happened at Night Live. I think that's I think that's fair. I mean, even going to, even without enemies. I mean, you know, the Protestants in the early 19th century who retreated into nativism when Catholics came over. You know, it's the same. It's the same. It's the same type of thing. Just some brief historical context on that Jefferson letter. Uh, I don't know, maybe I have a different view here on this. I agree with everything that's been said, and, and I, I wrote a book called Why Study History, uh, which is, came out last year, which, you know, Richard stole my thunder. You know, he, pre <laughs> he, took, he took every, a lot of the same arguments I've made. But on the, on the, Jefferson, on the Jefferson case, uh, this is a letter that Jefferson wrote to a group of Baptists in Connecticut, the Danbury Baptists, uh, affirming, uh, and, and that's where this term church and state, you know, is you separation of church and state or wall of separation, right? Uh, in 1947, the Supreme Court, this is the Hugo Black Court, uh, passed in this Everson versus Board case, Board of New Jersey, Education of New Jersey, passed this, uh, passed this law uh, saying that, well, the, the, the key phrase is, Black said that there is a separation, there's a wall between church and state, and that wall is high and impregnable. Now, of course, the words church and state or wall between church, separation between church and state, wall separation, is not in the Constitution, right? We need to be fair about that. Uh, it is, it, Black did draw from this letter, you know, from Jefferson. You know, so when people say, well, okay, you know, he, Black wasn't interpreting the Constitution, Jefferson wasn't even present at the Constitutional Convention, you know, this does create some legitimate historical problems. Um, but 
To say that there ever was a wall of separation in the United States that has been high and impregnable, uh, as an American historian, I want you, uh, tell me where, you know, that, it's not true. Um, we have military chaplains, uh, there's prayer before Congress. Uh, to suggest that this wall has always been high and impregnable, I think, is a misreading of maybe not the Constitution or Jefferson's letters, I'll leave the legal scholars to sort that out, but it's a misreading of reality. Uh, religion has always passed through that wall to certain degrees. Uh, I like the way James Hudson, the uh, library man, the manuscript librarian at the Library of Congress, put it when he said, "There is a wall of separation of church and state, but it has many checkpoints." <laughs> now, again, we may not like that there are many right. checkpoints. I'm talking as a historian here and suggesting that what what Black came up with in 1947 as high and inseparable does not reflect the history of America up until that point uh, in time. So there's a little historical analysis of that to go with Richard's more forward-looking um, you know, take on this. Just quickly on, as an aside on the history question, it truly is an important issue that needs to be addressed and it's a big divide with Americans. It's not until you travel and you realize how close to history much of the rest of the world is that you realize how, how really ignorant we are. I remember when I first stepped into reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian issue and I went and did interviews with Hamas and I couldn't believe they were talking to me about the Crusades. I said, I don't even remember, the, did I study the Crusades? I had to go back and what are the Crusades? What was that about? Not knowing that and trying to speak to the other world is a huge gap for Americans as we relate to the rest of the you world. You know, I'm wondering how many people either have read Lois Lowry's book, The Giver, or saw the movie that I think may still be out. Is anyone, a very few people have. But, you know, it struck me, but that, have you seen that film? Have you read the book? Probably not. You need, I uh, you, you should because it, it's, it's all about your argument. You know, because, because here, here's this, a utopian society that is trying to protect themselves from evil. And what do they do to protect themselves? They cut themselves off from history, from memory. Uh, and they have only one person in the entire society who is the rememberer, he's charged with remembering, so that he can give advice based on the history, right, to the rulers. But this guy lives on the very edge of the, of the community and is as irrelevant to the larger community as John and I are to everything, you know, everything in this country. That's exactly right. When I, when I saw this guy, I thought, it's me! <laughs> Okay, in the back there, yeah. Your voice is crying out in the wilderness. <laughs> the First Amendment was enacted in 1791. There was no separation of church and state in terms of our local governments and governmental entities prior to the Civil War. So when we talk about separation of church and state in the current case law. That's all post-Civil War case law. And that came about because the 14th Amendment was enacted, which made all those rights applicable to state and local governments. <clears throat> if, I could, if I could, yeah, I absolutely. I was, I was hoping to squeeze this point in. Um, was America founded as a Christian nation? It's a complex argument because many of these state constitutions, as I already mentioned, do suggest that, you know, we do want, you know, Christians running the government. I mean, so it's, you know, you could see where the argument comes from, at least on that front. But once you get to the 14th Amendment, post, you know, these reconstru the Reconstruction Amendments, you know, basically the Bill of Rights now is going to be applied to the states for the first time. Once the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment is applied to the states, the discussion of a religious establishment or a religious test for office even is null and void. It's over. You can no longer make the argument that constitutionally we are a Christian nation after 1866-67. Um, so the, to the question, is America a Christian nation constitutionally? The answer is absolutely no. 
Now you could define it as a Christian nation in other ways, culturally, demographically. You could, you know, people will make those arguments, but this is where this is where many on the Christian right who dabble in the past, I oh, I hesitate to call them historians. People who dabble in the past on the Christian right will say you know, no, no, look at the states, look at the state governments. Even, even, I even just saw where um, uh, uh, Thomas, Clarence Thomas, tried to make this argument again. You know, <laughs> that, it was, that it was, you know, the states have the right to have an established religion based on the Constitution. I don't know, I mean, I thought, you know, any, anyway. <laughs> so, so I w constitutionally, you just, can't, you just can't make that argument anymore, and that's where the Christian nationalists miss, it, miss out. That's where they miss the point. Uh, they don't have a sense of, again, back to the study of history, what history teaches us is change over time, right? I mean, I, I gave a lecture once where somebody said to me, Thomas Jefferson, right, he thought African Americans were, slaves were inferior to white people. Is that true? The woman said to me in the q and I said, yes, it is true. Look at, look at the, uh, the uh, notes on the state of Virginia. Yes, Jefferson believed this. And then she followed that up with, then Jefferson, if he was alive today, definitely would not have voted for Obama, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you see, you see the historical malpractice going on there, right? That just be so so change over things have happened since 1787, right? Um, and that's what I think on this question of the 14th Amendment and the state the state establishments and test oath. That's what we have to think. That's what history teaches us to see that things change over time, and we can't just make a gigantic leap from the 18 what what would George Washington think of a of a of a of a, a Christian manger creche scene in front of city hall i have no idea i don't know i know some principles that he believed in you know religious freedom for all but what what would he have thought about prayers at graduation at football games it, it, you know i once asked on a radio show what would George Washington's view have been on abortion <laughs> well, I mean, I think he, he defended life. On the other hand, he had a really bad track record of protecting the least of these, the weakest members of society, the slaves. <laughs> but you can't answer. See, so, so that's what I meant in my lecture when I said history is a very limited discipline. It can provide us with some signposts, but it, 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 doesn't, it just doesn't allow us to speak to the specific issues. But it does teach us change over time that we shouldn't be using the 18th century and everything about the 18th century to define today because things have happened since the 18th century. And one young lady I remember, she stood up and she said, you know, we must have done something to, this, to these people to get attacked the way we did. And to that, the late Mr. Jennings didn't have an answer and maybe he didn't want to open up a can of worms or he just kind of stayed silent. But that question, that young lady's question stuck in my head. And to this day, I still remember. And, you know, we've touched about religion, we've touched about politics. I believe that our leaders make political moves that are perhaps not just in the world. And for that reason, we are attacked. In the same way you mentioned the Crusades. I mean, these people are thinking Crusades. I think essentially what's happening in the world is that we make political moves, but then we reconcile with our religion. Case in point, George W., when he wanted to attack Iraq, consulted with the Reverend Billy Graham. And he asked him, well, should I do this? And the Reverend said, yeah, go ahead. So when we make our political moves, I, in my opinion, we always have religion to back us into that. And so in the name of God, when these planes attacked our, our World Trade Center, there were, there were points that they picked. And again, uh, the, the World Trade Center, there, there was a reason for this attack. They attacked us for a reason, and they called it justifiable by the name of God. So I think that's what we need to be discussing, and and we sh our, uh, we, sh we as a think as thinkers as political or whoever ought to stop 
thinking, or, or, or you are, ought to use religion to make sure that we are just with everybody. So that we don't have these attacks that, that happen. And so the ISIS is happening the same way. They must feel, be feeling unjust or, or feeling some sort of injustice. Palestinians are feeling some sort of injustice. So when you say they they are raising arms and against so and so, that's it's, that's the reason, and it's definitely not religion. I don't think. Let me come this Okay. Uh, so to mention the point of justice, and I want to get back to the question of that uh, young lady, she who said that we must have done something to deserve it. No, nothing. That Holy Quran is very clear. Those people are Muslims. They have to abide by the Quran. The Quran is very clear. I can quote the Arabic right now. The La Yajrimannakum Shana'anu Qawmin Ala Allah Ta'adilu. E'adilu Hu Akrabul Taqwa. That the enmity of a nation, no matter what anyone has done, should not force you to be unjust. Always be just. It is nearer to righteousness in the sight of God. So even the, whatever the politics behind the whole scene was, uh, the actions of those Muslims were completely unjustified, completely un-Islamic. Now, this leaves us with a question. I'm not disagreeing with your point. Of course, there are political realities which are involved there. Uh, His Holiness, the current leader of our community, who was in Harrisburg in 2012, and uh, the same year he was able to speak at the Capitol Hill in front of 35 uh, uh, senators and congressmen. There was a bipartisan, uh, and there were a lot of professors who were there and so on and so forth, and he gave a lecture. And he, was, and he had given lectures in European parliaments, and it's been compiled in a book. I have a few copies if anyone wants. Uh, it's on justice, the solution to world crisis in light of justice. The name of the book is World Crisis and Path to Peace, but he talks about this very issue, that justice, what is justice? What has been done wrong in the world in terms of what Israel and Palestine conflict is, in terms of what's happening in uh, uh, Iran, America, so on and so forth. And he has written letters not only to the Prime Minister of Israel, but also to the, uh, Iran, also to all of these countries. It's never one side to the story. But I want to be very clear about the uh, take of Islam on this, uh, uh, on this issue. That no matter what la yajri mannakum shana'anu qamin, that the enmity of a nation should not force you to be unjust to them. Justice should always be withheld. And those people, when they attack innocent civilians, they let go of justice. So in that regard, we did not do, America did not do anything to reserve that, right? But of course, there are political realities which uh, are there. But I also believe the Quran tells you, be careful not to let your anger push you beyond the bounds of your religion. I would just like to uh, comment on the fellow who mentioned, um, just mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago about um, George Bush going to Billy Graham. And I was here in this room, and a bunch of you may have been too. At that time, there were peace things going on all around Harrisburg. We had a march led by the dean. And all of the religious leaders in America, our presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church and many other bishops and leaders, all went to Washington to meet with the president and said, we do not want this war. And when they got there, they were told, the president will see you soon, but he doesn't want to talk about Iraq. <laughs> and why Billy Graham became the patron saint of George Bush, I don't know. I think he was for some others. But uh, I would just like to say there was, and to blame religion for this, that's my point. It was not a religious thing. The religious leaders were strongly opposed to. And I remember we marched up to the Peace Garden. And um, you maybe remember that, did you? And we marched up to the Peace Garden. But uh, we were all opposed to that. And yet, the president would not see any religious leaders. That was my point. You know, could I, uh, could I pick up on, a little further on your comment? I think uh, this man has raised a really, really important question that we really should not let escape. And your question is, why did they attack us? And. Uh, the conventional wisdom at the time, because I remember President Bush saying this, President Bush said over and over again, he said they attacked us because they hate the fact that we're free. 
which just struck me as sheer baloney. Uh, I, I think that's a question that we have been very reluctant to come to terms with. Uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called Myths, M-Y-T-H-S, Myths America Lives By. And I do believe that one of those myths that is deeply embedded in our national character is the myth of innocence. You know, we're always innocent. You know, there are evildoers out there, but not us. And, uh, you know, we stand for the right, we stand for the true, and we're innocent. Well, it's not that simple. And, you know, I'm not going to presume to answer the question, but I just want to affirm the question. I, th I think the question is, is a, is a soul-searching question that we really need to take seriously. And I'm so glad you raised it. And I, and I hope as we leave today, we'll continue to ponder that question. There are no simple answers to it, but it, it's, it needs to be thought about and discussed. You're, you're absolutely right, but I think even more profound was the answer the Imam gave. No matter what the U.S. did, Islam does not condone that kind of reaction. That was important for Americans to hear as well. You have me thinking about language and framing of issues when you're talking about when the enemy of a nation is identified with a religion, then that nation goes back to religion. And we're wrestling in the press. What do we call this? This Islamic State is what they're calling themselves, as if they are all of Islam. So it's that, it's almost like that was a genius way for them to name themselves, you know, and we're wrestling, is it ISIS, is it ISIL, is it what, whatever. But it's just the importance of what we're calling them may have an influence on how we respond in going to religion and whatever, more security and whatever, or um, just to be aware of that. And, and thank you. Yes. Something that strikes me as important is where do we get our facts today that tell us this or this is true? I mean, as individuals, we have certain types of experience in living, education, cultural backgrounds. So we hear differently. And so I don't think that everything's always transparent in terms of what we receive so that we may have as many facts as possible. And so as we talk about these many subjects that are interrelated and then you go back to our founding fathers and their vision, I can't help but think there's always something you don't know about. You said yourself, Dr. Fia, something happens that makes you change the story in a way of what you had before. And so we're all evolving, but it is terribly hard <laughs> to evolve and get along and have more agreement. And, and it seems to me like we have less agreement since 9-11. Maybe in the end we'll come to a solution that's better for everybody, but and the conflict is difficult for me anyway. I think our country, if you were to take a smattering of people, there's probably people that don't care and they don't read and they don't listen. They don't have much history, you know, at all. But I think that so many people just disagree politically, religiously. They're, they're not open to compromise. They're not open to learning more. And uh, the, the proverbial mirror for me, spiritually, I guess, as we're introspective uh, about, I can look at you and see me, <laughs> you know, in that connection, whether you want to call it spiritual or, or something else. So I just see more conflict in general within people. Mm -hmm. More polarization, mm -hmm. less, less ability to compromise. Well, that gets perhaps to education. It 
gets to the, yeah, and of course it gets to my pet peeve, the demise of the American media, because the modern day historians are not doing their jobs. This morning we actually, uh, one of the great gifts of the modern culture is this wonderful internet, and on this screen as we were doing a little conversation, it was B'nai Brown's TED Talk on vulnerability. And she's a social scientist and she understands one of the things that all people need is connection. And so she was really after that whole understanding about how do we do it and what, what blocks us. And one of the things as she began looking at that, she asked people about, tell me about your good experiences, your positiveness. And she always got these stories of brokenness and about pain and about suffering. And she likes to organize life, and so she really was pretty much put off by this because she wanted to clean it up. She wanted to fix it. And so she went after this theme of vulnerability. And she quickly said that the essence of vulnerability comes to a place where you need to be wholehearted. And she says that often what happens is that we respond to shame and fear because we wonder if we're adequate. And this kind of meeting is rare because in our differences, it's risky. When we talk to another faith, we're going into a different zone and a different conversation, and it's risky. And we really are needing to be vulnerable. And again and again, she, she reminded us that the way our society deals with it is to numb it. So, and she showed credit cards first, and then she showed alcohol and some other addictions, and then she also said certainty. Yes. And she says often, if you look at the government today, we are really stuck because we're not willing to be vulnerable, and we're not willing to sort of deal with those differences and develop a corporate vision, so we become certain in our positions, and we don't listen. And the essence of connectivity, honestly, is listening. And that's why I'm so grateful for this event. Is that, but I do think that, that one third percent is based on that certainty that's based on the fear of vulnerability. Yeah. We're going to, uh, well, what, thank you all for sharing. We're going to now have some concluding remarks and I'm going to throw out the provocative question this time for us to conclude. And that is, you know the truth is, I think you hit on this. Despite what the Founding Fathers may or may not have intended, we should know what's right and what's best for our societies. You know, why are we so stuck on whether they intended a Christian nation or not? Isn't it for us now, in this time, to decide? So why don't we take it and let you guys comment on that, whatever you want as concluding remarks. I'll, I'll comment on it this way. Um, I guess it was about three or four years ago when I was writing my book, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? Um, I was talking about some of this material with some of my students at Messiah College. Uh, many of my students come from evangelical Christian backgrounds. And I was questioning the whole notion that, it, that the founders believed that we, they were trying to found a Christian nation or that we live in a Christian nation today. And a student came up to me after class and said, I was really bothered by your lecture. Uh, I want to go into politics. And as a Christian, if we're not a Christian nation, what am I, what am I going to be fighting for? What am I, gonna, you know, what, what, why should I go into politics now? Um, and maybe my answer to him might be the answer to, to your question. Uh, you know, as a person of faith, in this case a Christian, uh, there are certain things that are that are important uh, to to live out one's faith, whether they be issues of justice, whether they be issues of um, you know human rights, whether whatever they happen to be. However, one translates their theology into meet the needs of everyday life. Those are the things you should fight for. <laughs> Whether or not we are a Christian nation or not, it really doesn't matter in terms of how we live our faith out in the world. Um, once again, this is the limits of, of history, right? I mean, what if, we were to, what if we were to conclude that, you know, the founders did want to create a theocracy? Right? <laughs> I mean, would that, would that stop us then from, you know, questioning that as a tyrannical form of, you know, so, so, this might seem odd from the historian talking about the limits, the limits of history, but also as a person of faith, 
I think that obviously trumps my vocational call as a, as a, as a historian. So, well, you, you, you live out, uh, you know, mercy, justice, love, uh, these kinds of things at the core of what my faith is, terms the gospel. Right? And, and uh, so I think that's the, in some ways it, it, it doesn't matter, but it, I'd be remiss if I said history also doesn't pro to provide some kind of very helpful context in which to know the culture in which you're living your faith within, right? So I'll stop there. So, so Joyce, now let me see if I've got this right. Uh, Who cares? <laughs> why, why, why are we so insistent on our positions? No, uh, really, it's on, as we look at history, sure. Yeah, yeah. But they couldn't possibly know. And why should we be so stuck on what they wanted anyway? Well, you know, I'll tell you my take on this. My take on this is, and, and, and of course, the imam, it would be interesting, I can't wait to hear you talk about this because you're going to come at it from a, a different cultural perspective. But in this culture, we have been so shaped in this culture by the Enlightenment. I mean, we, we just simply have. We, we can't escape it. So, you know, we, we think in terms, even as Christians, in terms of cognitive truth. You know, so my position is true. And then, therefore, your position is false. And we set up these kinds of dichotomies. And honestly, I'm not sure even the Christian religion revolves around those kinds of issues. I mean, certainly, if you read what Jesus had to say in the Gospels, it just simply doesn't show up. It just doesn't. Uh, I, I, was, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. You know, these are the, the, the... But somehow, in the Western world, we've intellectualized everything, and so it's my position on this truth. That, and I think that has something to do with it. I'm probably not the whole answer, but maybe partly. Thank you. Uh, I want to focus more on the value of focusing on what the... Uh, it's, not, it's less about what the uh, Founding Fathers thought, and more about what we can learn from what they thought. It's what we can learn from history, and that's what the, both of these historians are telling us. And Islam teaches me that uh, there's a narration of the Prophet Muhammad that wherever you find wisdom, it's a lost property of a believer. No? And from the age of enlightenment, which you mentioned, uh, the age of reason that we talk about, we can learn a lot from these things. And you mentioned, you made a very nice point that you know uh, Christianity went through something very similar to what Islam is going through right now. And studying history, studying that period, we can learn a lot. So for example, let's take ISIS. And I really like your point about whether calling ISIS ISIS. Unfortunately, I don't have another name, so I have to call them ISIS. And I think media needs to do a better job of calling them something else. And that's where the solution lies. They become more legitimate with us calling them Islamic State. And that's their whole uh, media goal or whatever. Right? Uh, but I want to mention that how were we able to fight all of that? We were not able to fight that through wars. We were not able to get rid of all that, through, uh, all the sectarianism within Christianity through bombing a specific thought process. We were able to do that through rationality, through reason. So how do we fight ISIS? How do we fight people like who caused 9-11 to happen? We fight them through a better brand of Islam, through a better brand of thinking. You know, these are people who have hidden behind the cloak or hidden behind the mask of Islam. And that's how they get their money. You know, the reason Islamic State is called Islamic State is because they need funds to, to function. And they only get their funds when they call them, themselves Islamic State. They want people to fight for them. How do you fight for Islamic State? When you call yourself Islamic State. Something very funny, I read an article, the British citizens who went to fight for ISIS, the last books they bought on Amazon, guess what book it was? It was Islam for Dummies. <laughs> So, so, honest, this is this is this is a this is a, I'm not remember I'm not sure if it was Independent or Calligraph. It was a very respectable uh, newspaper which quoted that that the last books these people bought from Amazon before leaving for jihad was Islam for Dummies. These are not people who understand Islam. These are people who are attract, attracted towards a brand. 
we need a better brand than IS. Oh. And that brand is the brand of peaceful Islam. And people like you, this is what we can do to fight ISIS. This program is fighting ISIS. If we can have more of these throughout the world, then people who are attracted towards the, uh, the jihadi or extremist version of Islam, they will have a better brand to go towards. They will have a better brand to be attracted towards. And I think that's what we can learn from history. That's how we fought the sectarianism within Christianity. And that's how we can fight this. Well, I know there's one thing we will all agree on. We have had a fantastic discussion. Yeah. It's been very, very, very And I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you, to David Messner, to uh, the Right Reverend Churchill Pinter, to everyone that was on the uh, panel, the, the committee that helped to form this, Michael Sand, Rabbi Chopper. I don't want to miss anyone because you all were very, very important. I think the names are on the back of us here because they really deserve a really an important uh, us to realize how important their work was to make this happen. With Akram Khaled, Jeffrey Dunaway, Ashok Shukla, Randall Tenner, Mary Wyatt, Bekvan, Zandie, Emmy Corey, Sadia Ahmed. And so I just want to make sure everyone knows how much they are appreciated and acknowledged. And really we thank you and we hope you'll spread the word that you'll come back out again next year.